Hi, everybody. It's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. It's a special day for me. As you know, I usually do Tuesdays at one o'clock Pacific. Not the case today. It's Thursday and I'm in James Cromwell's hotel room. Yes, that might seem odd, but we have a lot of business to discuss, James Cromwell and myself. He is, of course, right next to me, but I must first sing his praises. You know him, of course, from movies like The Artist and from being in the series Succession. And right now on HBO Max, he's on Julia. He's here in Hollywood filming another film. But most likely, if you're watching this show, you know this Academy Award nominee because of his role in Babe. James, I want to thank you for being with me. My pleasure. Thank you. We have so much to discuss. Of course, Hollywood is in business and it's in the business of telling stories. So today I want to talk about the power of telling stories. That might be your own story, folks. So I hope you take that inspiration from our uh, discussion today. But before we talk about you all in the audience, I want to talk, of course, to James. Um, James, when did you decide to use your voice in acting? And then when did you decide to use your voice for animals? Um. That's a good question. Uh, I actually decided to use my voice and with my almost my very first job, I had done uh, a season at Cleveland Playhouse, which is a resident theater company in Cleveland. And um, I was between jobs and uh, I went to um, uh, England as part of the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth and worked with the people in the National Theater. And when I came back, my father had cut a little squib out of the New York Times that there was a theater that was going to be touring the Deep South. And they were looking for actors and directors. This was 1963. So um, I went, I, I didn't, I had no politic. I went down, auditioned, got the job as both a director and an actor in Waiting for Gatto. And uh, boarded a plane, got off in New Orleans, met by the founder of the theater, went to the, um, this is a long story, I don't want to take up all your time, went to her the place where we were going to stay and it had a plaque on it, coloreds only, and I thought, oh, this is quaint. That um, This must have been an historical house that was once used by black people or slay. I don't know, didn't know what. And I went upstairs and a very nice black lady who owned the building um, welcomed us and took us to our rooms and then we went out for dinner and as we were ordering in the restaurant the owner of the restaurant came up and said i'll have to ask you to leave because the man who had started the theater both men um uh, john o'neill and gil gilbert moses were both black so i was sitting talking to john and they were throwing us out of the restaurant. I'd never been thrown out of a restaurant before. So I bunch up my fists like I usually do and stand up. And John says, no, 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 it's okay. That's all right. We'll just report it. It's a civil life, civil rights uh, violation. And so he notified the man that there would be a complaint. And the guy, I remember, was shaking. So that was my introduction. Then I went to a church to rehearse waiting for Gatto. And the minister of the church watched a rehearsal and said to me, she said, you know, do you know the play Waiting for God? Yes, do you? of course. Of course, Samuel Beckett. Yeah. So he said to me, you understand that Pazzo is as tied to Lucky as Lucky is tied to uh -huh. Pazzo. In the play itself, Pazzo is the master. Lucky is the slave. They are connected by a rope. It's around Lucky's neck. It's in the hands of Pazzo. But Pazzo doesn't exist in the position that is necessary for him to validate himself uh, he has to be the master and he has to lord over somebody. And he chose Lucky, who is um, a very interesting character we could go into. So then we we uh, rehearsed the play and drove up into Mississippi, into Macomb, Mississippi. And the as I looked, the church had been firebombed and we went to the Freedom House and there were more black men than I had ever seen in my life because I was raised in Westchester County. And um, a 14-year-old girl was describing how she'd been uh, beaten, kicked, spat upon, trying to integrate the lunch counter. And I thought, what country am I in? What, what is this place, Mississippi? I, little did I know that a friend of mine was there. Um, I was with SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was with CORE. Congress of Racial Equality, and that was out of Chicago, and he uh, and two others were missing. I didn't know that they were, you know, who, who they were. It just said three civil rights workers. So Mickey Schwerner was one of them, and I had 
I had played football and dressed uh, next to Mickey's locker, and so I knew him fairly well. And um, they killed him, all three of them. But yeah, so that's my politics. So my politics began in the they didn't call it the Black Liberation Movement that we should have. Uh, in the civil rights movement, and from the civil rights movement, we toured all over the South, and then I wound up working in a theater uh, in Stra in Stratford, Connecticut, and uh, I did we did guerrilla theater outside uh, to infuriate all the patrons who were about to go in and watch the Shakespeare, uh, and we had a very infuriating piece. Um, so my politics followed me then into the into urban justice. Uh, and support of the Black Panthers, which I do and did. Um, and then uh, I just, um, we, we, we went down to Washington, we closed down Washington. So I got into the anti-war movement because of that. So very quickly, every everywhere I went, it was politics. Politics came to me, I didn't have to go to it. So there's so much to unpack here that I think is really interesting. And the main point of everything that I'm hearing here is that I don't know if it's really possible to divorce one's skill set from one's mission and one's purpose. And you see how James sets out to be an actor, but ultimately his voice is used for politics as much as it's used for acting. A uh, quick factoid here. How many times have you been arrested? I lost count. Okay, well, we're going to get to some of the details of that in just a second. Um, but you said something about the two characters in Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot and how they are interconnected. And it is a flaw of human nature, I think, that worries me for the future of our planet, that we need to feel better than something or in control of something or master to some slave. The way we treat animals and the planet seems to run in our, our history. You see, it's in our history. Do you think it's in our nature? I, do you? It worries me that... Uh, no, I, don't, I, I don't think uh, human beings of that stripe have been around long enough to make any difference to human nature. That, I mean, when you when you think of it, societies, we're, we're all... If you go back, I don't know, 6,000 years, 8,000 years, uh, I, I suppose they think right. that the Egyptians were behaving um, deplorably, but that may also be a falsification of history. So I'm not sure, actually, once you begin to get civilized, no, they're not civilized, once you begin to get um, urban centers that depend on, on the surrounding area for sustenance and also for the collection of their wealth, and that usually means uh, optimizing the uh, production of food and aggressing against your neighbors in order to take the products that you need. So people coming together in groups, trying to find a way to live, went through various systems, feudalism, the dark ages, etc. And while we wound up with a thing called capitalism. So I actually think that the worst of it probably was capitalism. Obviously, and that is so I am uh, yes, I should have. I should have said right off the bat, I'm an anarcho syndicalist. So I'm I'm to the left of the left. Are you guys having fun? Yeah. Uh, okay. No, this is great. So this. Is, so you and I have a lot. We should do our own show. So the left and and I'm not the right, as we all know, but um, by any means. But I do think capitalism. Oh boy, I'm losing viewers left and right here. I think capitalism can be our saving grace. Absolutely not. Imp <laughs> imp impossible. Capitalism is um, is uh, the exact opposite of democracy. It, the The purpose of capitalist, capitalism is to maximize profit. That is your fiduciary duty. The way you optimize profit is to extract. Extra, is to extract is to pay the lowest possible wage, and then sell it for the highest possible price. And to put those priorities above the needs of the people involved in that process and the needs of the people who buy the product that you make. You are not wrong, sir. And, and we would agree on that. I guess I'm seeing a, this is conversation is going in a completely different direction than I thought. That's why it's fun to be live. Um, I, I, I'm. As you all know, I work with VegTech Invest on Wall Street, and I, I'm focused on ESG, and I'm focused on impact investing, and I see that there's not one currency anymore. There's not just the dollar. There's the currency of water and how much water we have. There's the currency of land, how much land we have. There's the currency of you know our healthcare system and 
how can you continue right, yeah, to that's politics you know to call it currency is to reduce the natural phenomenon necessary to the maintenance of life into a product that it get, can be uh organized and um, exploited and sold for profit so when you when you use the in other words my belief is that this society is toxic that means that everything in it, we can't escape the toxicity. We live in it. We breathe in it. It's necessary for us. We don't understand how there could possibly be any other way to live, but there is another way to live. Getting there demands a change of mind. Einstein said you can't solve a problem using the same mind that created the problem. So, so you have to understand that you the the change of a change of heart begins always with each individual it's not a political movement it's a personal choice once you make that personal choice things happen i love this this really is the heart of our conversation although we should have episode two and episode three you and i have lots to talk about um but that the change starts from within there will be no external change that will move our society forward it all has to come from within but when i think of what that means to have a I mean, you you strike me as mildly hopeful, which is interesting to me because when I think through history, we had people in chains and thought that was physical change that we could see, that we put on. We thought that was okay. Six million people died in the Holocaust or more. We thought, I, you, you think, oh, that wasn't possible. And so when I tell people, oh, factory farming. 15 million of black people died in the transportation from Africa to the United States. So, and, and, and. Black people built the United States. They built the wealth of the United States. As you can see in the colleges in New England, Harvard and Yale and Brown all have their statues to various slave owners that donated a lot of money. Yes. And so when I tell people, you know, conditions in factory farms, they say, oh, no, that couldn't, no, that couldn't be. I think, well, we look at how in history the human race has done atrocities to each other. Uh, the, the, description of factory farm conditions is real and people choose to close their eyes to it, cho choose to close their eyes to suffering. So let's, um, we, you've had such a long activist career, but maybe we'll move it to animals. When did you decide I'm going to stop eating meat? What made you change your mind? And I'm going to actually advocate for animals. I came across the country in, in 1975 uh, after I got back from, I hitchhiked around the world um literally um and um i went through the stockyards in texas for what seemed like a whole day on my motorcycle with animals on either side as far as you can see and in the background smoke billowing out of the out of the slaughterhouse and the stench and the cries of despair and the looks i said i can't i can't do this anymore so when I got to, to Los Angeles, uh, there wasn't really much support for vegetarianism and veganism in 75. There were lots of vegetarians, but, you know, there's a restaurant finding something that was convincing somebody that, no, you couldn't eat that uh, was very difficult. And it took me about 10 years to, to finally get rid of all I can't do without corned beef hash that, uh, you know, I, I isolated my little, now it's, everybody says I can't do it without cheese, whatever, they, yeah, right. whatever excuse they make. Um, it's of course a different circumstance. Now we know that the planet is imperiled. Then we didn't know that it was simply about, to me, it was cruelty. It had not, I was, I was fairly fit and, and I felt good. So it wasn't for health reasons, but of course there are health reasons when you pursue that diet. Um, and, um, it, it took 10 years to get my head around without deprivation around the idea that, that there was another way. So in a, my, in one small narrow band of my entire life experience, which is my diet, I realized that it is connected to everything is connected to it. I am connected to it. I am the recipient of both its benefits and its, and its shortfalls and its perils. So, um, and then I, I worked, uh, um, I was always a vegetarian and, and asked for vegetarian meals on the set. And then I was sent was, I went to Australia with babe and, I worked with these extraordinary animals. And then at lunchtime, 
they'd all be on the table uh, waiting to be eaten for lunch. And I thought, this, I'm, I'm making a movie which celebrates the idea of consciousness inhabiting all living creatures and even stones, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that uh, if you're going to change, you've got to, you, you've got to embrace, you got to take it right to its limit. And the, and the limit of this is to say, I renounce the use of animal products because they, they can't be made under this capitalist system, which even makes honey problematic. Then you have to say, um, okay, so I'll, I can, I can't do it much about Cargill. I can't do much about any of these large corporations. I can make a choice for my, uh, myself and I can communicate that to other people. And I can point out, without being too doctrinaire, because everybody hates it when they say, you know, do you know what's in that? On the other hand, if you look at the uh, epidemic of uh, obesity that we have, where do they think that's coming from? That's coming from um, industrial agriculture and the necessity to use antibiotics and growth hormones, two different antibiotics because it's not, it's a horrible in, inhumane place to live in. It produces cancer. And then on the other hand, the growth hormone is you want to get them out and kill them as quickly as you can. Somebody said, oh, well, what's wrong with dairy? They're just pregnant. They, and I, they, they just get them pregnant, they said. And I said, yeah, and it's a long steel tube that there is. And I thought, oh, man, this, I, it's interesting that you would say, though, that people um, – sort of don't notice our system of which i said was toxic the relationship of the fourth estate of of the media to the to power in this country means that of course they will not question the authority and the rightness of the system in which they live because the system is that they that we live in they need in order to survive and the, the New York Times has got to have more and more subscribers, the Washington Post. Now, if they tell the unvarnished truth to the people in power, the people in the power are going to say, we can just cancel you. Somebody will buy you. Mr. Bezos will buy you and will no longer ask those questions. So much to unpack there. I hope I'm trying to take notes here. I, I just want to do a little bit of mousy follow-up and some of the things that he said, because I want you to understand this. Um, some of the health implications from eating a meat diet, as we all know, or I think we know on this show, but let's go over it again. So heart disease, colorectal cancer, diabetes, these are lifestyle diseases. Um, Dr. Neil Bernard, Dr. Kim Williams, uh, head of cardiology at the, um, universe, at the um, Rush Hospital in Chicago, now in Louisiana, that's head of cardiology there. So uh, renowned um, doctors are all talking about these diseases diseases and how they can be changed with diet change. So that's just kind of a pickup there. Um, bees, why are bees problematic? Well, we've talked about this a little bit on this show. So when you mass produce bees, in addition to the conditions awful for the bees, you are mass producing what you do in all factory farms, which is you are making pandemics possible. So the large spread of disease there, and then the bees that you pollinate, that you mass produce for honey, they're very aggressive and they actually beat up on. That's not the right word. There's a better word, but I don't have it for me. They they intimidate the pollinating bees. And so this is actually bad for, you, you see how we are doing things that ultimately hurt ourselves. So not a very smart system. And then um, the hypocrisy of shooting a film like Babe and then serving animals while you're profiting. I'll go with you on this one on capitalism. While you're profiting off of a sweet, perhaps children oriented, or at least kind in, in theory, for loving for adults, but children, children enjoyed it because they didn't understand the parable adults wound up not understanding the parable They're either, violent. but it's there. Um, and then we talked about now let's stay with this one. Then we talk about media being reliant on the, the powers that be, but I don't want you to take away from this that you are not powerful. So we're going to come back to James and his power, which is his voice, how he's using it for animals. I do this podcast as a volunteer activity. I'm always on Wall Street using my voice there, but I use my voice here because I can, so I should, so I do. So how we use our voice is incredibly powerful. James might disagree with me, but when you use your voice and your dollars for the same thing, I think you are even more powerful. And I believe it was Margaret Mead who said, don't underestimate the, the power of a small, passionate group of people. I'm paraphrasing there. 
Uh, people probably don't know that one woman in New Hampshire got the world ban on landmines. One woman started it. Who was this woman? I'm, I'm, I'm Show notes. It's coming back. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't remember, but I just heard a program the other day about um, two women in the uh, beginning of the civil rights movements to whom Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thurgood Marshall both said what were were uh, pivotal to their changing their minds and understanding the issues that they espouse for the rest of their life. And this came from a wonderful black lesbian woman, or transsexual woman oh no she wasn't transsexual i don't know how, i'm not very up on it because i'm an old guy uh and and uh, another wonderful woman who was uh, uh in the trump administration and when he passed the travel ban when he tried to force the travel ban on certain muslim countries she and the justice department she was the head of the justice department she refused she said i'm not doing this this is anti-american this is anti-democratic this is this is arbitrary this is illegal so the power of one person and the power of one person's voice. And then they take that skill set. It might be studying law. It might be being an actor. It might be working in finance. They take that skill set. They match it with their voice. They put their dollars behind it. And you do see change. You agree. Yeah. And I I, I don't mean to mitigate. Those are two people in positions of power. Or one had the power of the, of the printed word. Any individual who raises their voice and asks for truth and justice, that voice always resonates nothing is lost that voice empowers somebody else who uses their voice and maybe there are two people and then there are four people real change does not come from the top it does not come from power because power because power is invested in the system as it is otherwise the system would be other than it is so everybody's voice counts that's the thing you must never lose what we have to do is we have to do it in unison with other like-minded people and not be torn apart by the divisiveness and the uh, the subterfuge and the mendacity of the system, which integrates itself into everything to make it impossible for people to feel empowered and that they can't have some choice in the matter. I 100% agree with this. Change always starts at the bottom because everyone at the top is so comfy. Why would they want change? So change always happens from the bottom. I, I might have this wrong, but I think even Lincoln didn't get behind the anti-slavery movement until it was w almost a, a fait accompli. Do I have that right? I don't know. LinkedIn? Lincoln. Oh, Lincoln. Yes. Lincoln. <laughs> Lincoln. As a matter of fact, I just read something about that too. Yes, as the more you deep the dig, uh, when you somebody like um, Woodrow Wilson, and Woodrow Wilson had uh, Birth of a Nation, uh, the movie by uh, Griffith, and he played it over and over again. He played it in the White House, and he was an inveterate racist. And so here you have this idea of this man trying to keep us at first out of the first world war and then reluctantly getting it it's all politics and bullshit the real point of it is that he was a racist supporting a system which still in that day and age existed in this country and has continued to exist it doesn't look like black people in chains it looks like black people in prisons being used by the by the military by the whatever the industrial a carceral system to produce product for corporations that pay them less than a living wage and use their labor to produce the products. And we have no idea what it is. So they worked it out that they went from slavery to Jim Crow to in into the carceral system, all of which are infected with the toxicity of capitalism. So, <laughs> so um, s slavery just uh, continuing, I, I think, is what you're saying. So it's um, nice and lovely to think it's all gone, and then of course it's still there, uh, raging its own ugly head. And we we have oppression in so many ways. I'll bring it back to factory farmed animals. Uh, uh, I, I want people to understand this to the extent that it's possible. When you have an oppressed party, I include animals in this, anything that is living, breathing, has family, has family communications, has, has sentiment. And if you don't believe that animals have emotion, please read Charles Darwin, who did a complete book on this in the 1800s about the emotions of animals and humans <clears throat> and how they're parallel. So when you have sentient beings and they are oppressed or people as well, none of us are free then. 
So if one aspect of society is oppressed and we oppress animals, but, but more than anything, we accept their um, conditions and their treatment and torture three times a day on the plate, you're never going to have a life without war and things that are bad for you, war and upheaval and strikes. And because when you take in that kind of anger three times a day, then that's what you know is anger. What do you think about this, Jim? I 100% agree. We agree. We agree on that. Uh, okay. Now, not everyone is going to be James Cromwell. Not everyone is going to get in front of a microphone and feel comfortable with that or get on a street corner. We are getting to how many times you've been arrested. We'll come right back to that. Um, did you ever doubt yourself when speaking up for animals or people? Did you ever think, I can't do this? The doubt the rightness of what I was espousing or my ability to make a difference? No, it's even more personal than that? Did you ever say to yourself, I don't want to be on the front lines. I don't want this kind of angst in my life or I can't do I just, it, this is too hard. Um, yes, I did have that experience. Uh, I, I will never have that experience again, God willing. Um, I was asked by a group in Los Angeles uh, to join them in defending the Biona wetlands in near Venice, uh, which was, which was, is one of the last, was one of the last remaining wetlands in Southern California. And then absolutely beautiful. They took me on a nature walk. It was a fabulous place. And I said, I'm in, uh, uh, Spielberg wanted to build a studio there on the Biona wetlands because it was easier to get a, by helicopter to LAX from the Biona wetlands than it was from coming from universal. So uh, I said, yes, I'm going to do it. And my then wife uh, was not at all pleased with the choice that I made. Um, and she got a friend of hers, a man named Richard Dreyfus, to tell me, he said, Jamie, um, you know, there's no such thing as the blacklist. I mean, that's in the past. And it's just not true. Uh, and, but do you think when your name comes up uh, uh, in Amblin, Ember, Entertain, Amblin Entertainment, that someone will say, isn't he the guy who's stopping us from being able to so I called him up and I said, uh, you know, I will march with you. I'll give you money. I'll do whatever I can. I'll volunteer, but I can't be the poster child of this. They, they understood that it was, I, I thought that it would make a big difference. Two weeks later, who do I see on television getting arrested for ch chaining himself to the fence where Spielberg was going to build Martin Sheehan. Yeah. And I thought yeah. Martin didn't flinch. Yeah. Martin, Martin's got a lot more to lose than I do. And he's there. And I said, I will never make the choice that something about my career or my life will be. And this is a more important issue than any one of us. It will take all of us. And then because, and we're all in it, but every individual has got to look at this and say, I'm going to make this choice. And when you make this choice, you have to take responsibility for what you get. There are always consequences. There are consequences for ducking and there are consequences for making the right choice. Uh, I'll paraphrase. Tell me if I've got this wrong. There's a lot of pain in not using your voice because when you don't use your voice, ultimately you're not sticking up for yourself and what you believe in and carrying that squashing. That's not the great word, but carrying censoring oneself comes with a lot of burden. And so I encourage everyone to find, and we're going to get tips from James, to find your way. It won't be perhaps chaining yourself to a, a chain link fence. Not everyone can do that or get in front of a microphone. But do you have words or tips for people to help them find their voice and use it in their way? Um, inform yourself. Hmm. Learn, go past what you read and there, there is no truth in the corporate media. There is no truth. It's 99% propaganda and 1% obfuscation. To, to me, they're, they're, they don't tell the truth. But the truth is there. It can't be, you can't squash the truth. It's there on these machines if you look carefully enough. What you have to get dig deeper. You have to see what a piece of legislation like the uh, the last one that Biden passed, I can't remember. Inflation Act? I, the IRA Act. Yeah. Well, we now know that Manchin, what Manchin got in there, then they realized he was so overreached that they were alienating people. So probably Biden and Manchin were up to, listen, I'll take back that uh, the, the, the whole uh, regulatory process be eased for the exploitation of, of fossil fuels. 
I'll give you a little bit, but it, we still got all that stuff in the in the legislation that passed. So that's the way that's done in Washington. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Or they do. Or they do. Uh, and they agree. And they would rather the public not understand that we have only one party. And that's the party of rich people, the party of business, uh, the party of economics. And then there are all the rest of us uh, trying to get the scraps from the table, which is not only unfair, it's almost impossible. I want to bring this back to the average viewer and remind you guys, you know, when we all went through COVID together, and I guess in many ways we can say we're still going through COVID together, a lot of people took to the internet and said, I, I'm not giving my health over to anybody anymore because this is BS. I rarely swear on this show, but this is, okay. you know, I mean, no, no, to me, you can do it, not me. Uh, so, and people said, I'm taking to the computer and I'm figuring out my own health. They went and they bought plant-based products. They started cooking at home. Granted, they had more time. I do get that, but they took their own health seriously and they didn't want to shop it out to anybody else anymore. And they sort of, they went to the computer and got the facts for themselves. You can do that on anything. So for the things that you care about in your life, you can do that. You can educate yourself. And, and you're saying once you educate yourself and you go find out and don't let, don't empower someone else to run your life. It's your life. You run, you empower yourself to run your own life. You're thinking that that, that encourages people to um, find a voice. Well, I'm, I'm, su I'm supposing that you make a choice beforehand. You, mm -hmm. you it, informing yourself without a commitment to an, in, having an intention and putting your attention on that intention to have it manifest in the world, you have to make the choice. Now, do you have to go in and change your mind? And I happen to believe it's the heart that you change. Once you change the heart, once you're willing to look with your heart and to, the, the key word is love, of course, but empathy, to be able to empathize with the predicament, not only of other human beings, but all sentient beings, what they suffer by what we are doing and have done, and to understand the Aboriginal people of in all areas of the world always say the people in the West have lost touch with the spirit. And that's what we have because we don't see that this entire wonderful planet that we have is simply a manifestation of our own consciousness. What do you see in the progress since the beginning of capitalism to, and in our culture? as I said, our toxic culture is, it is cancerous. In other words, it is out of control. Cells are not good or bad. They do the things that they're supposed to do. When they get out of control and they lose sense of the whole, they destroy the whole in, in thinking, I got, but I gotta, I gotta eat. I gotta eat. I gotta take over. And of course, that's the end of the, of the host. So what James is talking about here is that we're all starting to act like that, right? We're all so focused. And I, I don't blame. Life is hard. And our life now is hard. So uh, I encourage, James, you can chime in on this, uh, empathy towards oneself first. It is hard out there. And if you are a single mother of three, sweet molasses, that you're holding down a job and you're cooking at home and you're trying to make it all happen, Amen. How can you do it all? And the pressure is amazing. And the vitriol of politics, my God, it's it's there to um, encourage hate. I just don't know what else to say. So I'm so happy I'm not in politics because um, I think there's so much positivity to be had in the world. And I love the decision I make for myself, James, and I don't use my voice like you do, Lord knows, but the decision I make for myself, and you know, maybe this will resonate with you all, is that Empathy towards myself first, and I decided in my tiny little corner of the world, I'm not doing this. I will not participate in that. And that's it. That's not even a statement to the outside world. That's just a statement to myself. I'm not doing that. I'm not oppressing that person. I'm not hurting that person. I'm not hurting that animal. I'm not taking part in that. And then anything else I can do from there is a bonus. Great. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean it like that. I mean, I'm, no, I. It's great. It, it's, it takes a lot of courage just to make this, just to face yourself and say, this is what I hold to be true is no longer true. I can see, I have seen past it. I have seen to the root cause and the root cause, root cause is false. And I won't participate in it. <laughs> um, but okay, so not everyone's going to go big and bold like you do, but I'm wondering if you also go small. So sometimes you're out there getting arrested. We'll talk about SeaWorld in a second. But if you're on a movie set and you're on them all the time, in fact, that's what we're doing here in Hollywood, or he's doing here in Hollywood, and I'm chatting with him. Um, do you ever say like, hey, we're the vegan options in the food service, folks? Like even that is its own bit of activism. Like, hey, where, where are the, you know, non-animal products? 
Well, even in the things that that is quite true, it is not conscious and animal products are everywhere and things we don't even know that they're in. Uh, but just, just understanding and talking, we, we don't communicate to each other about these issues because somehow it, it we don't like being confronted. We think it's, well, we're confronted and we're, the mirror is held up to us and said, take a look. So, uh, if we talk to people and we said, even the little thing, do you know what's in that, what you're eating? Or do you know how that is made? Do you know where milk comes from? Do you know what happens to the cow? Do you know what happens to the calves? Do you know how long they live? Do you know what they've done with afterwards? Do you know they don't, the babies are ripped away from them? Do you think they don't care about their babies? Now, somebody hearing that says, uh, the first thing they do is, I don't want to take know. responsibility. No, see, they'll know. They do know I because it's there. You, you, you would have to be, a brain dead not to see the connection what they refuse to do is they refuse to feel they they accept the idea oh somebody told me that animals are just that's what they're here for god put those animals here on this planet to serve us well that's completely turning the whole idea of why we're here and the we were sent to be this husband the 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 supporters of this planet to to the way the American Indian deals with the buffalo herd. They don't take the best of the buffalo. They take the, the buffalo that they can catch, the buffalo that are infirm, just the way the wolves do. That preserves the balance. What we do is we take the best of any species and we kill the best and the biggest and the strongest and the smartest. And we leave the drink and then we say, well, they're just dumb animals. Well, they aren't dumb animals. We've made them dumb just like we've made the people of the world dumb by feeding them lies, by feeding them inferior and and uh, uh, polluted food uh, and messing with their heads through propaganda. And then we wonder, well, uh, why are they behaving the way, why did they behave like? There's more to January 6th than just saying it's run completely by crazies. Behind there is the idea that they are getting the dirty end of the stick. And that the, nobody is speaking for them and somebody is responsible. The fact that they have been brainwashed to think it's people of color, it's people, it's refugees, it's somebody else, it's Jews, which is coming, and then blacks, which is coming, they're responsible for the pickle that I'm in, that I my job no, I can't afford my house. I only have four hundred dollars in the bank. If my wife gets sick, it'll bankrupt us and I'll be out. I'll lose the truck, I'll lose my job. They those pressures are there every day for people in this country in the working class and the working class and it just gets worse as you go down look what's happening in philadelphia kicking the people out of their housing or look what's happening in in jackson mississippi with people not having water to drink yeah it always the canary is the people of color in this country who actually manifest the dysfunction and toxicity of the culture as a whole so much to unpack there. And uh, I, I think the thread I want to bring through in what you're saying is, um, you know, nowhere else in nature do you see the host eat on itself, eat its own foundation. We are um, eating away at our own foundation. Animals don't do this. They don't um, kill off their own to only humans are um making their own foundation so unstable such that their existence in the future is now tenuous. You should say that what it is, it's men. Oh. <laughs> Have you got several hours, people? We might be here a while. It's men. M men don't deal with their feelings well. Uh, we've been trained not to suppress our feelings, so we don't know what we're feeling. We think we do everything with our mind. We think our mind is infallible. And we resolve all conflict, conflict with violence. I'm a man. I'm a, I'm stronger than you for you are. Therefore, my position is right. Well, of course, that's stupid. Women instinctively, because their bodies and their and their spirits and their um, their consciousness is so connected to the consciousness of the universe, because they live it. It breathes. It breathes through them. It changes them. They understand this, and and they seem to relate because they don't always think well i'll just knock her head off you'll think no no if i should talk, we should talk we should really sit down and have a nice i gotta be smarter than that i gotta be smarter 
I, I do want to draw the parallel here because now we're talking about women and I want to make that parallel because uh, we're talking about animals as well. We've referenced it several times here. Now, why is dairy so bad? Well, we talk about a life literally running through women and it is the same with mother animals. Pigs sing to their young. They're extremely smart. When um, capitalism, when uh, the in North Carolina, the farms flooded and they literally locked all of the factory animals. I don't even call them factory farm animals because I have enormous respect for farmers. That's a different conversation that we can have and how farmers are going to come through this better when they transition to other farms. They're going to make more money. I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't know how he feels, but we can, <laughs> I think we can give a much better economic situation to farmers and we should. Yeah. So a different conversation, but very important one. And, miners, and people who work in the extraction industries, they all got to work. They're trying to make a living too. hundred percent. And they should get better livings and better quality of life. Neither of those jobs are very easy, by the way. But um, as we talk about uh, factory animals, that mother, that cow, for example, I used to think how silly. I used to think like, well, don't they just have extra milk to give? I had no understanding that they were forcibly with a long metal rod kept pregnant their whole lives. They call it a rape rack. That's not my term. I would never come up with that kind of term, but the industry uses that term. That's their technical word as a rape rack. And it is used to keep that mother cow pregnant her entire life. As soon as that- Not a long life, by the way. And then it's used for hamburger meat. So that if you think, oh, well, I'm just involved with, you know, ice cream, it's it's ultimately meat. But um, and then her, as soon as she has that baby, her baby is taken from her, kept in small crates, usually for veal, which is not allowed to stand or baby cow is not allowed to stand or move male cows. Right. So they don't develop muscle. And they develop anemia and that's, you know, what you're eating. So you're eating that pain and torture as well as heart disease and the other things. And uh, that mother is kept in a permanent state of despair. Her entire life is losing her babies in a permanent state of despair. Anything to add? Uh, only that it's interesting. Um, the understanding and empathizing with the conditions of factory farm animals, how grotesque it is. Uh, and how it impacts us. There's something going on in Brazil, which is that the lungs of the earth, if you think of the planet as a body, as an organism, the lungs of the planet, the things that make the sky blue and the air breathable and the rain natural and do not account for these storms, that is being put to the flame. They're burning down the lungs. So if you have an objection against your government, imposing on you certain restrictions having to do with covid and wanting to jab you and you don't and you understand that you don't trust the government and you would never let them jab even though crazy say of course they're putting in chips i'm, I'm leaving them out i'm just people i have friends who just said i'm not doing it and then they cannot make the connection between that and what is happening around the world is the world is destroyed as, as the poor farmers in the Sahal and, and in Somalia are, are losing their livelihood. And there are now two and a half million refugees. And there will be 1.5 mil, million children die of starvation. You have this incredible imbalance and you have people who in their minds think, yeah, it makes perfect sense to burn down the Amazon. We we can we can grow soy, soy we can more hamburger. So actually, everything that is wrong in this country is epitomized in the hamburger. The price support, which if you really had to pay for a hamburger, would cost you twelve bucks. Uh, and the the industry is supported. We keep people eating that diet so that they do develop the diseases, which we know that they will. So they will go to a doctor. The doctor will put them in the hospital. They will operate. They'll use the most sophisticated equipment and money will be displaced. The government is an engine for moving the wealth of the people upward towards the very few. That's what government is for. I think you're almost being kind there, if you can believe it. I, I think that, um, Government's almost hell bent on the destruction of planet Earth because the decisions that are being made are so incredibly stupid. What what living entity takes out their own oxygen system? And that's what happens when you're willing to cut down trees to grow crops 
Do these crops that have protein and fiber, do we give that to people? No, we give that to factory churned animals. And then of course they need time and water and land and hey, more food. We cut, we cut down more trees that produce our oxygen. Oh, and by the way, it pulls carbon from the air. And when we cut them down, it emits carbon. So that's a double whammy. No, no, but it's also our oxygen. Uh, it's a, uh, this is why it's so important to have a voice. You know, if you, you know, if you, if you are, you might not be making all the connections that we're making with animals um, and, and how, you know, if, if we agree to oppress animals, we're never going to have stability and peace as, as, because you've, if you've signed up for, I'm okay to oppress and hate that sector, whatever it is, you're, you're never going to have balance. But even if you don't want to go down that rabbit hole, you did have a little bit of experience during COVID that maybe my government doesn't have my best interests. So that's kind of interesting. Okay. Um, We've talked about so much here, and poor James has a life to get back to. Um, I, okay, you're okay, good. Um, SeaWorld, let's get into it. Can you tell the story in your own words? It's one of your more famous arrests, being arrested situations. Uh, but but tell me why you went to SeaWorld to protest and what happened. Um, we went to protest the treatment of the orca, um, uh, this in incredible animal, a uh, magnificent animal that a lot of people knew about because of what happened at the SeaWorld and I think it was San Diego. Uh, they respond to captivity the way human beings, when put in wood, uh, who were put in solitary confinement, it's uh, antithetical to what it is. We, we're not meant as a species to, we're meant to, we're, we're a group. It has to be the group. Uh, and uh, so, and to see them, to see the tank, not not the big tank that they swim around when all the people are there, but where they hold them beforehand, and you see the dorsal fin flopped over because there's not enough pressure because they don't swim enough, exercise enough to get the dorsal to rise, which means their whole system is basically failing. They're, they're going, they will drown. And then you see the bites and the uh, teeth mark along their flanks because it being in such close proximity, they're not supposed to be. So they take it out, of course, the same way prisoners do on, on their fellow prisoners. And they swim in their own urine and all the chemicals that the industry puts in their pools in order so that they're not sick. And people are enjoying this, this circus. In the world. I, I don't like circuses, but... Um, and not thinking, it's like the minstrel shows. Of course, the people all over this country looked at minstrel shows. I don't see anything wrong with it. They're just, it's just white people. Yes, they put blackface on. Because you don't know what it's like to be a black person unless you live in a black person's skin. And unfortunately, you can't do that unless you do what they did in Gentleman's Agreement and die yourself. And then you go out and same. it's the same for women. Women, men have no understanding what it is to be a woman, especially a woman in business, and what they come up against every day in dealing with the dysfunction and the illness that most men walk around with, which is their misunderstanding about the other and their right to the other and to aggress against the other. So. I, I don't want to ever stop, James. I just want to chime in there because I think that concept of other is so incredible. As long as we define, hey, we're not connected. You are other than me. We will always have instability. Instability, we might disagree on this, but instability, bad for business, bad for your health, bad for your future existence. If you have children, if you have children, instability, very bad for them. So as we seek to find harmony on our planet and in our homes, um, I think it starts with us just saying, I will not participate in that. And I will not participate in that. And those little movements um, help. But uh, James, what I think is fascinating about you is that um, just you're, you're not seeking justice for one entity. You're really seeking justice in a comprehensive way. I don't, I think if there's only justice for human beings, there is no justice. There has to be justice for every sentient being and you know, somebody said the rocks are the smartest thing on the planet because they invented humans to carry them around. <laughs> uh, so I would, the entire planet, I have no idea how it resonates with the cosmos, the vibrations of the cosmos. So I assume that I don't know everything. I assume that every entity, that every being, that every species, that every object 
should be dealt with with as much respect as any artifact that you see from any Aboriginal culture, always in reverence and in wonder and in uh, joy and in uh, and very very aware. Some said somebody said the other day that in some Aboriginal cultures they thank the person who gets sick because they understand that one person sick in their culture means that the, something is out in the culture. And so that's why they get the, 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 the shaman who lives outside of the community, come into the community to minister to the person who is ill, not to heal them, but to find out what it is that the community has done that has put it so out of balance that one of its members has contracted this disease. I, I love this way of thinking about the world. And hopefully if there's anything that you take away from this interview, it is to think differently and educate oneself and to implement that in your life in whatever way is comfortable and makes sense for you. I love you mentioned three out of four of my favorite words there. So we have love, we have joy, we have wonder. And for me, we have discovery. That's what I want my life to be all about, which is why I'm not in politics because politics is all about, you know, red versus blue and north versus south and anti versus pro or whatever. They're always fighting and they're always unhappy, which doesn't fry my vegan burger. So I want that life filled with love and joy and wonder and discovery. Uh, okay, as we wrap up here, you are such an incredible storyteller and you are filled with facts. Do you think that you will do any directing coming down the, the pipeline? You do a lot of acting, but will you do more directing and maybe work on some stories like the ones that we've been telling here, the interconnection of the earth and all of its entities? Um, okay, this is the problem that I'm wrestling with. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how it's done in this culture. I have a project of my of my heart. It happens to be a play by William Shakespeare. It happens to be about his understanding of the end of his world, uh, which was ending as when Elizabeth died and James came in. What he what he uh, lived and what he what he experienced was an England that was transitioning from being a community, the, the commons, the idea that people took their sheep out into a public land that was held to graze their sheep so that they didn't have to own great swaths of lands because they couldn't. It belonged to everybody. And as soon as James got in, he enclosed all those areas and gave them, parceled them out to the Scottish uh, princes so that they would not fight him and fight each other. And that way they created this uh, system, uh, uh, this Yes, a system, really, of wealth and power uh, concentrated at the top. So um, I, I, I don't know what your question was. Are you, are you working on a project that you might direct that um, not, on these I, themes? I want, I want to see if I have the strength to act it. Um, okay. It's King Lear, and it's done in Sarajevo during the Siege of Sarajevo, which was, of course, one... one member of the community pitted against another person in the community who have both lived there all their lives in perfect harmony. And then somewhere, someone somewhere else decided that the one of the parties should take over and you had Serbs killing Muslims and Muslims killing Croats and Croats ki killing Serbians. And, uh, and I think it has a lesson to be learned if you could do a production in which you tell the truth. I recently saw a film, a Danish film called War, which is about the consequences of war on this one soldier, particularly. All, of course, it's a group of Danish soldiers and his wife at home dealing with what she has to deal with, also impacted by the war that he is fighting because he is not there to support her in the raising of their children. And she has all the issues that, that women deal with every day that are never reported that they that it's the most important work done on this planet is done by women in raising families and it shows the impact of war and how we just sort of we just sort of ingest it without question that this is the way things are he has to be in a certain theater which we probably know is that is a part of aggression by somebody to take over the resources that are there and drive the people off the land. So he's out there on patrol thinking he's protecting democracy or a way of life. And he's not, he's simply the vanguard of the oppression that will come after he is finished and they, and the corporations move in. And 
Um, and the the life of, that this affects everybody. Okay, the movie is War. I'll have to w look at it. But I'd love my takeaway there is there's real no winner when one sector is oppressed. So I think you had said if yeah. the famous song. Oh no, am I forgetting the singer? Um, if one of us is chained, none of us are free. And I think that's sort of what you're talking about is no real winner in war. And then war has all these ramifications. And you think for what? Who won here? Who who got anything here? So as we wrap up. Yeah. I don't think I answered about SeaWorld. What was? <laughs> uh, well, uh, tell us the SeaWorld story. So you told us why you protested yeah. SeaWorld. And then um, you got arrested. So how'd that go down? Well, I had a bullhorn. And I stood up once the, once the event started. And the, the place was full. And I just started yelling at the top of my lungs. And the, I, some guy in front of me took a swing at me, but he didn't hit me. He hit the bullhorn, which implo imploded, exploded. And uh, and then I, so I was escorted outside and I was taken even out of the confines of SeaWorld with a hand somebody sent to make sure that I didn't come back in again. Uh, and uh, and that we went through the whole rigmarole. It was. Uh, you know, you get charged with things and they get lawyers and th the way the system works. Now, I did, it's a piece of cake for me. No problem. I have no problem. Wayne Seung, who is Wayne Seung, oh, direct okay. action everywhere, is being tried in a Utah court for taking two piglets thrown on the dead pile to a veterinarian to save their lives. He is being charged with theft and conspiracy and whatever else, and that the court will not allow documentary evidence of what it's like in a piggery to be shown to the jury because it might upset the jury. They are planning to convict him for something that he did to save life, to point up the, the horror of what that system is, and those people should be venerated and 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 acknowledged for being true heroes. I want to reiterate what he's saying here. So he's talking about piglets that were thrown on a dead pile that were still alive. So here is someone having the most basic of human emotions. Let's hope that their basic human emotions is trying to help some being that is suffering. So when you see something that has been left for dead, you know, would you walk over someone on a sidewalk that you see has been left for dead? You'd probably reach out and help them. That's what he did here. And to protect industry, which is already supported financially um, to our own demise, right? So we are taxes pay for subsidies that go to hamburgers that then make us sick. And then, oh, hey, by the way, you're paying that health care bill. Um, and we're running out of, you know, the, the, um, extensiveness of our own healthcare system, we're almost outliving it because there's so many people that are sick. I'm going down a tangent, but I want to come back. So he's talking about basic human nature here being um, held uh, as a criminal intent. Yes. Yes. Awful. Um, so, okay. You, you, you got off easy with SeaWorld, but um, uh, thank you for doing it though. Oh, yeah. Good. Then all the times I've been arrested, I'm arrested mostly because I work with PETA, and they like doing it. I like I like the organization. I like I like the ethics of the organization. I also like that they have the courage to get in your face. Uh, I can see that you like that. <laughs> okay, but one thing I don't want people to take away here: if you're not getting a bullhorn and going to SeaWorld, or if you're not yeah. working with me, you can yeah. you can join James anytime. Right. Anytime. But you you don't have to. No one has to do that to stand up for what they believe in. So if you take that time to figure it out for yourself, not anyone else, not your neighbor, not even your partner, not the government, just take that time. And it does take a little bit of time to have some self-reflection and figure out for yourself what's meaningful, what's important for your next generation of kids, what you want to stand up for. That's that's all you need. No, but, I mean, thank God James has a bullhorn, but not everybody does and not everybody will. And that that counts as well. Okay, a couple quickie questions here as we wrap up. Um, if you can, I try to keep these to one sentence answers because I'm I'm looking for that really like I didn't overthink it. I just spit out my answer. So uh, predictions, usually I say predictions for the plant-based business world, but here I'll say predictions for planet Earth next three to five years. Mezzo, mezzo. Not, yeah, could go either way, That's, people. We're at the we're at the tipping point, and and it's up to us that we get on the right side of that point. And fast, I would agree with that. Um, what do you wish you knew ten years ago that you know now? What did I? 
What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I knew 10 years ago what I thought was right, and it's still right. And that feels good. That's very empowering to know that which is right and not be led by others and their truths. Find that own truth for yourself. Uh, you are having a busy day like today because someone comes into your hotel room and interviews you all day. You didn't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? My go-to snack? Uh, well, it was the uh, it was the ultimate food bar, but they went out of business. So now I, now I have another one. So um, no, basically I have, um, I've, I've collected my, you know, the foods that I need uh, to sustain me. And it's a very simple diet. Some people will find it a little repetitious. It doesn't have to be. As you can tell from the show, uh, the, this cuisine is extraordinary. Uh, I, I, I hab habituate two restaurants, Crossroads and uh, Gratitude. So I, 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 almost every day. Uh, so so that, that's what I, when I'm not home and at home, I have a, there's an extraordinary woman in my community who makes the best soup filled with love. See, I, it's the love in the cooking that makes the difference. Not, it's the ingredients important. The knowledge is important, but it's the love. It's the care and, and that you are giving to somebody the, the means of sustenance. So she makes wonderful soup for me and I live on Soup and vegetables and salad. And I enjoy every morsel of it. May I ask your age, sir? 82. Okay. So you see what kind of energy, and this guy's like ready to take on the fight. So you see what kind of energy you have at 82 when you're living with whole food plant-based. And when you can't go whole food plant-based, you roll on over to Crossroads and you have some great lasagna, the vegan cheese and mix on Beverly and uh, real food daily. We got lots of choices here. Lots of choices here, which is so awesome. Okay. My very last question for you. What are we always going to find in your fridge? Uh, Arm and Hammer? No. <laughs> Baking soda. Baking soda. Uh, what are you going to find in our... N nothing that involves an animal. Nothing that involves cruelty to any other species. Uh, food that is conscious. Food that is healthy. Food that is aesthetically pleasing. Uh, food that is a gift. Uh and an opportunity to get together with people you love and talk about the things that are most important. It's so beautiful what he says. He mentioned before his friend who makes soup with love and how you can taste that difference and feel that difference. The opposite is also true. Food that is based on factory farms, you know, you feel that. That comes right back to you, which is why this show is about James, but it's really about you finding that truth. And don't listen to us. And please don't say like, well, those two crazies, he's got a bullhorn and, you know, she's bopping around from finance to not. And, uh, you know, those two crazies, that doesn't resonate with me. We are irrelevant here. Find your truth for you. Live that in your way. Things will change. You will see a difference in starting with your world, but that will ripple out from there. I could talk to you forever, James. I, I really do want to say I am deeply grateful. I am deeply grateful for everything that you do for animals. It would be so easy to not use your voice and say like, yeah, I don't want to get involved. And you use your voice all the time for people and for animals. And I am deeply grateful. Everybody, I love you too. You, you guys are also great. Thank you, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. Uh, I will see you at my scheduled regular time next Tuesday. Bye, everybody. Thank you for all you do, and thank you for thinking about all this stuff. I sure do appreciate you.